Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I'm the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today is September 3rd, and it's the very tail end of summer, but we're going to take advantage of it. And this evening, I'm sitting down with Cecilia Tan, who's in Boston. Cecilia is an international woman of mystery, so she says. <laughs> and she's also the uh, a 2010 Saints and Sinners Hall of Fame inductee, along <laughs> with creator of Fetish Flea Market and the founder of Circlet Press. How are you, Cecilia? I'm I'm good. I'm good. It's a uh, it's it's back to school time. Even though I'm not in school anymore, it's like you know something about that September spirit is like I got to learn a new thing. I haven't figured out what I'm going to learn this year, but you know, we'll see. There's always okay. something new. <laughs> what would you like to learn if you could choose something? Oh gosh, you know, I've been it, during the pandemic. We did a lot of stuff. Like I started taking an online Japanese class, and ah, then, you know, you know, Scott. Oh. Yep, yeah, and uh, learned a lot of cooking new cuisines and things because we weren't going out to restaurants and, you know, all these things where we're trying to get our needs met at home, you know, um, and whatnot. So, yeah, and so now I'm like, all right, what 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 is going to be next? I might have to take up a new hobby, maybe, maybe something artistic that, you know, use doesn't use words like my normal job, you know, um, so something that exercises other parts of my brain, <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, actually, maybe maybe Chinese calligraphy which okay. is kind of writing, but really isn't, you know, so. <laughs> I don't Challenging know. too, I should think. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, I'm happy that we're finally sitting down to do this. It's, as I said, September 3rd. We were supposed to do this in July. In July, yeah. Well, didn't that turn out to be a big mess with what, that big... What city did you get stuck in? You got stranded in Detroit, was it? I was already there, but that's oh. as far as I could get. Um, the As you know, the whole of the American aviation world just gave mm -hmm. up and shut down on July 19th, yep. which yep. was the yep. day yep. I was supposed to come to Boston. Yep. It so wasn't just aviation. Worked. Yeah, the, the global IT meltdown uh, did things like it wiped out my tax payment. So I just got a bill saying that I had filed my taxes but didn't pay it. And I'm like, we did pay it. We paid it like electronically directly out of the bank, didn't we? And sure enough, it didn't go through. So wow. yeah. Mm, wow. So. I'm sorry, Uncle Sam. Uh you know, here's that extra interest that I owe you for the global IT meltdown. <laughs> yeah, that was a mess. But I guess it was just meant to be. So yeah, yeah. now we can sit down, I guess, and do our interview here on Zoom. So I say, technology tears us apart. Technology puts us together. It's <laughs> technology left me behind somewhere in the Stone Age, and that's as far as I ever got. So, um, ah. but okay. So Cecilia, please tell us a little bit about your family and where you're from. All right. Let's see. Um, I grew up mostly in New York. New Jersey area. I was born in New York City. Um, my dad is a first generation immigrant, came here um, after medical school in the Philippines to oh. uh, you know, become a doctor. Um, and then my mother, uh, you know, she actually met him in the hospital is the funny thing. Um, she uh, uh, she was actually having a gallbladder attack or gallstone attack or something, which is how she didn't know that she's taller than he is until they went on their first date. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, I believe she took it as her excuse to never wear high heels again. Uh, so <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So, um, yeah, so grew, grew up basically, you know, New York kid, kind of always thought I'd move back there. Because when you're from New York, you think that New York is the whole world. And then, uh, you know, New England for college and uh, and just never left um, kind of a thing. So, yeah, settled in the Boston area for, for a job in book publishing, actually. And then um, just, yeah, never never went back. Um, so <laughs> yeah, um, the, uh, and then of course, Boston is where I sort of made my home in, in the leather community as well. So, you know, I'm one of the, was one of the first people to join NLA New England when that chapter first got started in 1990. Yeah, I think I, I might be off by one year there, but it was, it was back in the 20th century. And then, um, yeah, it was one of the, 
one of the board members who transformed it into the New England Leather Alliance. We reincorporated, you know, sometime in the early 2000s uh, as a sort of separate organization um, to run th events like the Fetish Fair Flea Market and uh, offer educational classes and, you know, go, go so a little bit beyond just the NLA mission statement to our own sort of, you know, New England based mission statement. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, you know, yeah, got, just got sucked in and never, you know, never left until I did retire from, uh, from leather activism, supposedly uh, some, some years ago to concentrate on my writing career. Um, but uh, you know, but I still get called to do fundraisers and, you know, judge contests and you know, all that kind of thing. So I'm retired from that stuff, but I retired from running the flea and doing events and, you know, being on nonprofit boards and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Let's come back to some of that because there's a lot there we need to talk about. Mm. But I recall when we were preparing for this chat, you told me some very fascinating bits there about your father becoming a U.S. citizen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, it's kind of fun. So, you know, it, back in those days, if you had applied to be a permanent resident, which he, which he had, you could be drafted. Okay. And, um, you know, Vietnam War was going on at the time. And they essentially told him, well, you're, um, you get two choices. You can g go in the army as with your current citizenship status, which is actually Chinese citizen because the Philippines didn't recognize illegal immigrants from the from china which is what his parents were oh, so oh. whole whole like double whammy of not being recognized by different states and whatever oh wow okay uh, uh and you know in which case if the vietnamese capture you they'll kill you or you can go as an american citizen and then we can barter for your release and he was like well, i'll take the free citizenship thank you you know <laughs> yeah okay. so you know did Two weeks crash course, I think, of uh, went to Texas, did this like crash course in American citizenship, got citizenship, and then went straight to basic training. You know, like there was, and there was a whole group of doctors essentially that all went through this together. They went through basic together, and then yeah, off off he went um, to to Vietnam, and uh, the uh, and when he came back, you know, used the GI Bill to buy our first house and you know all that kind of thing. So I was I was like three when he when he went, um, and. Uh, yeah, that that was an interesting time where you know the uh, we lived with my grandparents in Florida for a while, and uh, which was you know so and then and then we when he came back we lived in Kentucky for a year, um, which is why I, a lot of the stuff that I wrote, you know, as a I kind of taught myself I literally taught myself to write I taught myself phonics but I didn't know about spelling and so everything that I wrote at that time, you know, with crayon on, on manila paper is all with a Southern accent. <laughs> now, how do you know there's a Southern accent when you're just reading it? Right. So, well, so for example, there's one little like poem, whatever about a flower. Cause I drew a flower. It's spelled flower, F L A R. Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> a flower bloomed. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, um, and then, but people are like, yeah, you don't have a New York accent. I'm like, I don't have any accent really because we moved around a bunch at that formative age, right? And then, uh, yeah, um, I have all the New York, you know, vocabulary still, even though I've been living in Boston all this time. But uh, yeah, you know, that the what's, New York- What's an really example really... of New York vocabulary? Um, like we call pizza a pie and oh. here they don't call it a pie. They're like, what are you talking about pie? And I'm like, a, a it's got a crust. It's got stuff on it. It's a pie. Uh, you know, like why it's a pizza pie, you know, yeah. when the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza pie, what, what, what are you talking? You know? And they're just like, we just call it a pizza. And I'm like, okay, fine. Their pizza here sucks anyway. Uh, so. <laughs> Oh my everyone knows my rants against Bo how Boston pizza is not what it should be, but uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. New York, New York pizza is a thing. Everyone loves the pizza of their youth. You know, you imprint on mm. it, right? It's just yeah. like, I don't know, like the first pornography you see imprints in, on you in a certain way. I think that the, that first pizza just sets your expectations for the whole rest of your life. So, you know. But you mentioned that at one point you lived in a, a New Jersey KKK town. Oh, God. In the world. Yeah. The uh, I, I believe this it may still be this way. I'm not sure. There's a town called Clark, New Jersey. And um, yeah, one, when we moved out of New York City and into the suburbs, you know, my dad was still working at a um, hospital in New York City for a while. But then he was going to go into private practice in New Jersey. And my mom, who's a white one, 
you know, went to look at houses and, you know, whatnot. And so we uh, found a house to rent, nice big place. You know, my by then it was me and my brother and, you know, two cats. And uh, they were um, not suspecting that, you know, you needed to double, ch- you know, to look to see either school's good, you know, wow. that kind of thing. It was, it was accessible to the, you know, the parkway and whatnot. And uh, um, on my first day of school, apparently I came home and said, mom, it was weird. All the black and Hispanic kids were out today. Hmm. And, yeah. and we had been, you know, coming from New York city, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm expecting a, a more multicultural, you know, I don't know, kind of situation. And then my dad's out front mowing the lawn and a neighbor came over and asked my mother, where did you get your Japanese gardener? And what, at what agency did you, uh, adopt your children from? And my mother oh my was gosh. like, what is going on here? And it's like, they're such white supremacists that they looked at someone like me and were like, oh, you're not white. And I'm like, I, as half Asians go, I'm pretty much on the white seeming side, I think, compared to a lot. So, you know, but they wow. were just like, yeah, wh- what agency did you adopt your your Asian children from? And my mother was like, we have to get out of here, you know, like, it, and then met the one Jewish family, uh, you know, who, and the mom took her aside and she said, let me tell you what's going on here. This is a covenant town and it's a conspiracy among the real estate agents, the police, the, you know, everyone that only, only, only whites live in Clark. And oh. yeah. Yeah. And that that was the 1970s. This wasn't like the 1950s or the 1920s yeah. or, you know, yeah. something like that. And right in, right smack in the middle of New Jersey, this isn't like all the way down in Wildwood or something either. This is like, you know, 10 minute drive from Newark. So it was like, okay, how long has it been like this? Maybe I don't want to know. And so, mm. yeah, we, we moved out of there as quickly as we could get out of that lease, <laughs> basically. So, um, yeah, that was, wow. that was an interesting experience. And it's one of those things when you're a kid, you don't experience racism sort of the same way. And it wasn't, other kids didn't treat me any differently, right? It's like, they didn't care. It was their parents who were like, you yeah. know, all trying to figure out what I was, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, I'm, I'm really surprised that that late there was still a covenant there mm-hmm. that I thought those had been eradicated mm-hmm. by them, but I'm mistaken. I I think it I think it was still going on for decades afterwards too. I don't know wow. how it is now. I don't know mm. anyone who still you know lives in that town. Mm. Um, but yeah, even even when I after I had graduated college, there was a whole thing where a black family kind of accidentally bought a house in Clark, and the literal burning cross appeared on their lawn. Oh my and, gosh! Yep. And you know, and I mean, think about that. And that was during the like the Clinton years, you know, like the liberal Clinton years, and you were just like. Okay, this the, the racism that is is exploding now has it was just simmering then, right? It was still there. It was never eradicated. It was just people were waiting for their chance, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, th- that's 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 why you know all of our all of our subcultures need to have a reckoning about it because it's one of the issues of our time that really has to be grappled with. Um, yes. you know that that and of course me too is the other thing right that especially in you know ours is a culture of consent the leather culture is is a subculture yeah. based on literally based on consent and yeah. of course we're, that doesn't make us immune to it at all right um yeah so yeah that the, those are the two things i think that all all activists in every realm have to have to be grappling with right now yeah. um you know ladies knitting society whatever you know you name it <laughs> right so. But your your uh, your kink awareness and your journey began with an early episode of Star Trek. Oh yeah. <laughs> now Star I'm Trek a, and- I really Don't- like original Star Trek. That's my favorite right. thing. So right, right. do you remember I mean, the episode? Oh gosh. So well there's the one with the um with the green slave girl, right? Okay, yes. And they early have, on. They've, yeah. they've got like the shock collars on and all that. Yeah. And then and the other thing that was really formative for me was Batman and Catwoman. Yes. And I mean, you know, this is a, a kid's show, but, you know, you go back and watch it now and you're like, man, this is this is really kinky, actually. You know, like there's there's the whole episode where she and her, you know, kitten sidekick and, you know, Batman and whatever. It's like they make the kitten and Robin kiss and a bunch of stuff like that. Like there's a whole bunch of like this is not in the subtext. This is in the text. <laughs> you know, like yeah. this isn't like. Oh, it's coded or anything. It's like they literally make him kiss and, you know, stuff like that. And when I was, you know, five or six, of course, 
I've got friends. We play Let's Pretend, you know, and whatnot. And I had various friends where we would play Batman and Robin, but really we always played Batman and Catwoman. And we would okay. trade off which one of us was Batman and which one of us was Catwoman. And of course, Batman was the one who was getting tied up and, you know, tortured in whatever way. Um, yeah, my, my mother many years later was like, yeah, I don't know exactly what you guys were doing, but I kept, you know, like I kept finding like ropes around the washing machine, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Like we had a, when, you know, the first house that we bought with the GI bill, right. in in New Jersey was like, had a big basement, like, you know, with a big like rec room, you know, okay. like a TV room and, you know, whatever that had like, I guess previous to that, the previous owners had like had a lot of parties and whatever. So there was like a little bar built in there and oh, whatever, okay. like the laundry room, a storage <laughs> room, you know, whatever, yeah. a bunch of stuff. It all kind of finished off. And so, you know, we would go down there and play and then we would just be down there for hours, you know, after school or whatever. And then, it, you know, it would be dinner time and, you know, my friend would go home um, and, you know, my mother later would go to do laundry and she would be like, why are, why are there ropes around the dryer? <laughs> but, oh, we were, we were just playing, you know, whatever, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, putting stuffed animals into bondage was a was a thing, you know. And I, it's because cell phone cameras did not exist then. You know, my mother does not have like a, oh. a an album of my animals all in, you know, all in bondage. But uh, you know, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I can't I, help it, but ask. Um, I I can't remember the name of the Star Trek episode, but there's one where. Kirk had to wear an agonizer, or the other oh, characters yeah, yeah. did too. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. 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 That one must have gotten you excited. Oh God! Yeah. Just all. All. And this is the thing: is that not only was this going really deep, sort of into my, you know, sort of childhood understanding of sexuality, but, um, but this is part of why I wanted to be a science fiction writer. Right. I knew Whoa. from when I was really small, I'm going to be a science fiction writer. That's what I'm going to do. And then, you know, I. I some of the first books I read were like, you know, Madeline L'Engle um, and, you know, just some of some of those like, you know, they were at YA or middle grade, we would call them now, you know, whatever. But like the Newbery Award winners and a lot of them are fantastical. You know, they've got other planets and magic and spaceships and whatever. Right. And it's just like I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. Um, and, you know, at the time, there wasn't that much of it. Right. There was Star Trek you know, nominally superheroes, you know, whatnot. My dad loved superhero comics. That's okay. part of how he taught himself English in the Philippines was that was GIs would give them comic books and candy bars, like Hershey bars and cans of spam. And so my dad loves Hershey bars, spam, and he loves comic books, right? Or Okay. My, my, <laughs> now, my now deceased father loved, loved comic books and he would bring them home for me to read, right? It took me years to figure out he was reading them first and then giving them to me. I'm sorry, he what? That he was reading them first and then giving them to me. That he wasn't just like happened to buy a comic book uh, on the way home for me, right? You know, and he bought Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, you know, whatever. He 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 would buy them at the newsstand, you know, on his way to the, you know, to commute and whatever. And yeah, and I just I think I was like in my twenties when I was like, you know what? I bet dad was reading those. <laughs> you know, and of course. I mean, the DC comics are all very kinky also. I mean, you know, Wonder Woman's got the golden lasso that, yeah. you know, can tie you up on its own and force you to tell the truth. And, you know, and she's got, of course, she's in a corset. She's wearing manacles, you know, whatever. And it's like, you I mean, come see on. It. She's, I, I mean, it's just, it was just in the water, in the air kind of a thing, right? So it's like, yeah. I'm, I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe, of course, I was going to be kinky because these are my influences. But of course, I gravitated toward them because I think I already knew deep down there was something kinky about myself and i also knew to kind of hide it you yeah. know it's like as a kid you just you've i don't know you've absorbed some sex negative messages like you know like my family did not actually believe that masturbation was evil or any of those kinds of things but i got that message sort of from the general air you know that kind of a thing where it was like oh i, I think i think i'm not supposed to do this or if i do it i'm not supposed to talk about it i'm supposed uh -huh. to hide it you know whatever and then at one point, when I was a little bit older, and my brother was actually, you know, one or whatever, um, my mother came out with some pronouncement where she was basically like, you know, 
I don't know, like my brother was fondling himself in the in the bathtub or something, right? Because he, he he can't even talk yet, right? And and my mother's like, oh, that's perfectly okay, you know. Like human beings are, you know, have needs and you know, blah blah blah. And you know, this was also the '70s when there was just a lot of like kids running around without clothes on and whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, <laughs> there was a lot of just like they just throw them in the bathtub and throw them back on, you know, into the whatever <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. It yeah. was very, you know, a lot of hippies and whatever, right? We were not really hippies, but, uh, you know, my mom was influenced by them, I guess, enough to be like, you know, free range children, you know, they, <laughs> they can take care of themselves, um, you know, whatnot. And it's like, now, of course, like, I don't know, it, it, it's not the norm now, obviously, to just let your kids run around the neighborhood with no clothes on, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> In do, fact, do you now think you don't that, even run around the neighborhood without supervision at all, right? It's like, well, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you think that that sort of free range attitude? Do you mm -hmm. think that that influenced how you currently see your sexuality out in the community? Mm, maybe. I mean, so I, I think part of it is that you know, like I taught myself to write, you know, and things like that. So the first thing that adults start telling you when you're four and you can write is oh you're very creative right and it mm. becomes part of your personality you know yeah. where i mean it's already part of my personality but it becomes one of the labels you apply to yourself right it's like oh you're so creative you you've got such a good imagination right and it's like oh it's so this is a good thing right and of course my imagination was extremely active and you know i was daydreaming all the time about stuff um some things very you know sexual and some things not you know so um but I didn't sort of separate out like which are the daydreams that are kind of sexual and which are the daydreams that are just kind of, you know, I don't know. Like uh, when I was bored in class, I used to daydream that I had a little teeny house in the yard of my actual house that was like okay. the, like the size of a cardboard box, you know. And then in my mind, I'm like, how would I decorate it? What would I have in it? And, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I, I, And I think this actually came from like we'd gotten a new refrigerator delivered oh, and it comes yeah. in that big box and mm -hmm. i was you know i was a pretty small child so i'm like this box is actually large enough for me to live in you know and i was like i could have a little bed over here and i would have a little desk over here and i would put books here and my stuffed animals would be here and i would you know and i like had a whole plan in my mind of like what i would do but like that was the kind of thing that i would occupy myself with while school was boring because i was you know gifted child who was sort of ahead of everyone, yeah, they, right? they weren't so, challenging you enough that's the they were not really right challenging there. me and then what at that school system, though, what they did was they would send the gifted kids to a couple grades up for uh -huh. reading and math. So, and this is how kind of oblivious I was, you know, so here I'm, I'm in kindergarten, but they're sending me to the second grade for math and reading. And I didn't realize that. I just thought there that those kids were larger than us. Hmm. And I was like, and like, literally, I'm like, I wonder why all the big kids physically big kids are and like it did not occur to me that that's not another kindergarten class that's oh. a second grade class like I, it just didn't par i didn't parse it that way i was just like oh i'm in the class with all the small children and I, <laughs> you know like it just doesn't occur to you you know somehow i don't know um this is this is like the maybe just part of the self-image where it's just like you don't think of yourself as I don't know. I never thought of myself as um, different from other kids, even though I thought of myself as very different from other kids at the same time. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's like I knew there was something different about me, but I had so many things that are different about me. It's like I was one of the only two half Asian kids in my class, in my kindergarten class, you know, that kind of thing. I was I knew that I was not only kinky, but I knew that I was queer, although I didn't know what queer was then. Right. And okay. it's like, um. And the mm. funny thing is, I'm not even the first queer writer in my family. My mother's next youngest sister is Maureen Brady, who is one of the founders of Spinsters Inc., which was one of the first feminist lesbian uh, small presses in America. Wow. Right? Yeah. So so she started Spinsters in, you know, 1970 or something like that. Right. And then how fascinating. And I started Circlet Press in, you know, 1992, you know, 22 years later. Um, yeah. You know, but it's like, wow. oh, there, I've got a role model. But I didn't know that she was a lesbian until I was like 11. 
you know. Um, and, and how was that explained yeah. to an 11 year old or how well, was it explained? It wasn't explained. This is the interesting thing. It's like they just figured that I would figure it out. You know, like one of the things about being a gifted child is that they figure you either know already or if you don't know, you're going to figure things out on your own kind of. Mm -hmm. And I was not the kind of kid who asked a lot of questions. I was the kind who would kind of observe until I figured stuff out. And I literally didn't figure out what the word gay meant until there was a TV show in the 70s called Family. I was about to ask right. you about this. Right. And there was a an episode where it was like one of not one of the family, but like a friend of the family yes. was going to come out or something like that. And the thing was, we didn't even watch Family, but there were then like news reports about it where they're like, tonight, the controversy about a gay character on Family and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they show like a 10 second clip. Yeah. And I was like, oh, is that what they mean? say gay adults are tricky they use words that mean other things to mean things that, that they don't want you to know about you know i was just like man no wonder it's you know <laughs> no wonder it's so confusing right and as soon as i got that i was like oh that's what aunt maureen is you know kind of a thing and it was just like it, all of a sudden it clicked i'm like that's why they always used to laugh so hard when i would say i would be the flower girl at her wedding oh you know <laughs> like, let's like all one... fell into fell into place right it's just like man all this time you know like someone could have just explained it right but no yeah <laughs> but for the benefit of the audience because there's gonna there are going to be audience members all over who will not know the program family right mm -hmm. uh, we're of a comparable age so we know this <laughs> please explain it for a moment for people who don't have any idea it was just it was like a you know primetime drama show that was like an hour long one so not not a sitcom but right. a like i can only compare it to things that are older than it like the waltons but not in the country <laughs> it was like the waltons but just in the suburbs yeah. you know something like that so like a big family all living in a house and then just like the dramas around their lives yeah. you know yeah. that kind of thing yeah I the family drama the, yeah the only other episode i can remember is one where one of the characters has gotten a Jewish boyfriend and she tries to make chopped liver and it goes horribly wrong. I, <laughs> I don't know that episode, but yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. And of course it was, I was only one of the three subplots going on in the, you know, whatever, but I was just, and it was just like, she wanted to do something special for him. The lesson I learned from it was she wanted to do something special for him, but she should have just told him you know, like, I want to do something special for you. Do you like chopped liver? I've oh. heard chopped liver is a thing your people like, <laughs> you know, because then, of course, I think in the, part of why it went wrong is that he actually doesn't like chopped liver. Uh. She doesn't know how to make it. She tries to make it from beef liver instead of chicken liver, you know, oh. whatever. I can't remember what all the things whatever were, but it was, it was like, yeah. there, I just remember there's one scene of her like in the kitchen trying to like cut up a beef liver with a knife and she's like covered in blood. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that so that left an impression. <laughs> You know, but the, yeah. the lesson I took from it is like, oh, like negotiation and talking to people is actually really important uh, you you know, in relationships. And, you know, I honestly, one of the things that attracted me the most to leather when I first discovered that it existed was I'm like, oh, you mean it's actually just part of this subculture that you have to talk about stuff, you know, and I was getting out of a vanilla relationship at the time where we just did, like there was way too much stuff that was kind of assumed or not spoken of or we didn't know each other well didn't know ourselves well enough and we were you know in our 20s so it's not like yeah. you know you're a baby you don't know anything about yourself yet really and you know i was just like i i've reconnected with that that ex-boyfriend once or twice you know since then where we see each other once in a while um he lives all the way on the other side of the country but you know occasionally we cross paths and uh, and it's like, why were we so dumb? <laughs> it's like, I think we were just young and inexperienced. And, and we thought, you know what? We're smart. We should be able to figure this out. Right. But, you know, sometimes actually having someone else who has some experience, you know, guide you through some things. And, you know, couples therapy is a thing. And yeah. um, you know, we did not do it. We just we just went our separate ways, you know, when we're like, all right, we just can't make this work anymore, you know. And then, of course, right after that is when I realized, oh, and part of why I couldn't make it work is because, you know, there's this whole side of my sexuality that's not being expressed. And, you yeah, know, yeah, um, yeah. that, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, poly bisexual switch, 
um yeah i got complicated multivariate needs <laughs> you know, so well and you when you went on to uh college in boston mm -hmm. your your sexuality really progressed things really yeah. picked up for you oh tell yeah, us yeah. about that well, so the, the thing was, so I, I actually went to, I went to Brown, which is in Providence, but, you know, close oh, enough. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, Brown, even in, especially in the eighties was very, very much on the like diversity, you know, Brown is the most left wing of all the Ivies, oh, you know, okay. so it's not a surprise that, you know, I ended up in Cambridge, Massachusetts after that. Right. <laughs> um the you know, it's like, where else can I go? That is this liberal. There is nowhere else except maybe this one place. Um, you know, or Iceland, right? Oh, well. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, so it's one of those things where, you know, how like you come out, you have to come out multiple times in your life, I feel like. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, first I had to come out to myself, you know, and I mean, that probably ha I came out as bisexual to myself probably two or three times where I like, the first time was I was maybe 11 and I had figured out what gay meant, but I didn't know about bisexual yet. Uh. Uh, and then again, it was like a news report about David Bowie. And it was like, they were like, you know, tonight at Madison Square Garden, blah, 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 bisexual rocker, David Bowie. And I was like, you, you know, like your antennas just go up. You go, what? You know, and I'm like, oh, you know, like a new word. And I was like, oh, that's me. And I just, that was all the processing I did at that time, which is like, oh, that's me. me. That was it. No, you know, no, no deeper than that. I'm here 11. I don't have any deeper thoughts. And then I had to reprocess it when I had my actual first crush on a, on uh, a girl, uh, you know, who just came teenage hormones then came and you know so forth and so on and it was like oh my and for a second i was like wait am i a lesbian oh no wait i forgot i'm bisexual right and it's like yeah, yeah, yeah um i forgot about that part and then i did a whole thing where like in my i tried to kind of come out to my family as a as a high school senior where i wrote myself a part in a play um as the bisexual hamlet who can't decide wow. between these two other characters my my english class wrote a play where we each took the role a role from from liter from english literature you okay. know, whatever. And then mm -hmm. it was it was all uh, an homage to our uh, our teacher who was retiring that year. Oh. So, um, so I, here I wrote myself this part as the bisexual Hamlet. I spend the whole play kind of going back and forth between the two of them. You know, whatever. I think it was Ahab and Tess, maybe, or the two <laughs> characters mm. that I'm like I'm, I'm like equally in love with. You know, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> and but you know, it's like it was too subtle. Nobody got it. Um, and so I go to college, and then I go to my first meeting of the, you know, what was then called the Gay Lesbian and Gay Student Association, okay. right, the LGSA. Um, and there was no B yet, there was no T yet, you know, none of that, no Q. Um, we didn't have those letters yet, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and it was one of these, like, you know, you're like tiptoeing up to the room, you know, like there's posters up that say, you know, oh, you know, Andrew's room 210, 8 p.m. whatever. Oh right yeah, now. okay. Towing up to the room, and it's one of those like kind of looking around, and be no one had told me yet about gay standard time, oh. so there's nobody there, and I'm just like, there's nobody here. What do I do? Okay, let's 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 w take a walk around the quad, you know, whatever, and then and then we'll, we'll, we'll just buzz past, you know, and I'll like like 20 minutes, and I'll buzz past, and I'll just try to look into the room and kind of see if it seems okay, right? Uh, I don't know what I was expecting exactly. And, you know, and 20 minutes later, still nobody. And I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. all right, whatever. So I go around, the, take a walk around the building, play the piano a little bit, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm walking around the outside of the building and two people, two hatchbacks pull up and a bunch of people get out and they've got like grocery bags in the back and, you know, whatever. Oh. And one of them, Angela Taylor, actually who is still, you know, I'm still in touch with today, takes one look at me and says, oh, are you here for the LGSA meeting? Can you help us bring these things in? And so, so much for my, like, I'm going to have plausible deniability. This is what I'm here for. I am now carrying things in and setting them up. <laughs> you know? Jump right on it's in. Like, you're, you know, and like once an activist, always an activist. It's like, you know, from that moment forward, there was no going back, right? It's like, okay, now I'm, now I'm always the person who is, bringing the things, setting up the tables, doing the whatever, you know, it's like you just, you enter at a certain point and then you just, yeah. you never leave, right? Yeah. Um, but, but I was so, you know, there was still that kind of like, but do bisexuals really belong here? You know, kind of question. And it, I was so, I felt so much on the outside of the gay community at that time that when Brown hosted the Lesbian Gay Student Union Conference where thousands of gay activists from colleges all over the United States and Canada came for this big 
thing, right? Um, and there was like a huge pride parade, which I'd never done before. It was a nighttime pride parade where we, you know, and we marched through the quad, you know, like the the quad where all the uh, hmm. the frats are, and you know, all that kind of thing. It was it was it was it was fun. It was really really fun. Why but, why I mean, at night? It's more fun. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time people could figure out when to put it in the schedule. I don't know. Hmm, it, okay. And the thing was, so it, I think the, um, but the main speaker was a guy named, you may know this name, Gary Studs, who was a congressman, a uh, congressman from Massachusetts who came out as gay because he was outed for having an affair with a page. Right. Oh. So not exactly the best positive representation ever, but but he, hey, he got reelected. He stuck with it, you know, so forth and so on. And then here he is. He gives this and he, he gave a speech where he literally said the message of Harvey Milk was come to San Francisco and be gay. Uh, and the message that I'm giving you now at the end of the 1980s is stay where you are and be gay. Um, and I'm getting goosebumps remembering it. But uh, I heard that keynote speech that he gave from literally outside the dining hall where he was giving it. It was like this, you know, big dining hall in one of the dorms, you know, that had these huge tall windows and all the windows are open. And I was standing alone in the courtyard outside because I wasn't sure that I belonged in that room. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, you know, so, of course, maybe one year after I left college, they added the B to the name of the organization. And then, you know, okay. now it's, okay. <laughs> whatever. So it's like, you know, wow. The bisexual moment was coming, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then there and then there was the kink side of it where like I just knew from, you know, like, I don't know, by by osmosis that I should not go near the women's studies people, you know, oh, okay. so, some of whom were very, very, you know, Andrea Dworkin kind of devotees. Right. And it's just like there's a certain kind of militant, you know, feminist who believes essentially that sexuality is bad um uh, that sexuality can only be used as a weapon it's not uh, actually a positive part of anyone's personality and it especially isn't if what you want to do is get tied up and beaten right <laughs> you know it's like oh well you, you've just been brainwashed by the patriarchy into wanting that and i'm like i don't think so uh, no no i don't no i don't think this has anything to do with that at all yeah. <laughs> but you know but they're, but they're not going to listen to you right so um so yeah so i i just knew to steer clear of sort of that whole you know er area mm, and then yeah. you know graduated and moved to boston and uh and actually got connected first with the online community um this is the you know this is the very very early days of the internet there's no world wide web yet it's all like alt sex bondage yeah. and you know groups and email lists and you know whatnot like that and it's just yeah. like those are the days when like you could get like a free CD for a six hundred minutes on AOL, okay. you know, whatever. Like that's how people yeah. were getting connected to the internet was like looking up a directory of phone numbers that their modem would have to dial, yes. you know, and yes. it's just like oh my god, yeah. So that 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 era, um, and you know, got yeah, got hooked up with a bunch of people and was like, you know what, we should throw a party, and we should throw a party at uh, at a science fiction convention. Um, at the time, uh, a convention called Gay Laxicon was uh, a thing okay. that where every gay year Lexicon? it was called okay. Gay Laxicon. So it was a gay mm -hmm. science fiction convention. Mm -hmm. um, and it was held in a different place every year. You know, sometimes it was in D.C., sometimes it was in <coughs> whatever. Me. And it was going to be in the Boston area. And I was like, hey, guys, we should throw a party. You know, anyone can get a room in the hotel and throw a party. And you know, your party could be anything from we're having a blueberry pie party. Come and have blueberry pie. Yeah. You know, whatever. And I'm like, let's have a kink party. And let's, I don't know, see who shows up. Well, it, we called it an ASB party because it's alt sex bondage. And I'm like, oh, well, this okay. is a sign that says ASB party and the number. And anyone who knows what that is will know and will come. And then people who don't know what it is won't come. Won't right? come. Yeah. And, um, and I think we actually had the entire convention in our room at one point <laughs> during that, you know, it was a convention of like 300, 400 people. And um, I think we probably, everyone passed through at once some point point because everyone was like oh there's a kink party going on oh there's a play party happening you know there whatever. You, go. <laughs> and, you know and it was just like this is the thing i was like i would love for someone to invite me to a party like this so i could experience it but i guess i just have to start it myself yeah you there know? you go so, and, and this is do you see a pattern <laughs> right it's like every time i see a need i'm just like well i guess i'll just have to be the one that does that <laughs> you know 
So the way the fetish flea market got started was. Well, hold on. Let's let's visit let's visit something else that I think is really sure. important for you to bring up. Sure. And I don't want to I don't want to diminish it. Is uh -huh. how your writing started to bloom oh, as yeah. foreplay. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. You yeah. tell. Mm -hmm. Well, so when I you know here I graduated college and I've been mm -hmm. telling people since I was four that I'm a writer. I'm going to be a writer. Wri writing is what I want to do you know, blah, blah, blah. And I moved to Boston for a job in book publishing. So I thought, okay, that's mm -hmm. a good thing for me to learn. If I'm going to be trying to make it as a writer, I'll learn how the publishing industry works and whatnot. And then I just, um, but I thought, okay, but I've got to actually sit down and write some stuff, right? You got to sit down and write the stories. You got a beginning, middle and end. Yeah. And I set myself a challenge. I don't know why I thought this, but I, I'm like, I set myself a challenge where I'm like, I'm going to write a story every week for five straight weeks, like the five weeks between Christmas and, and, uh, between new uh what do you call it thanksgiving and christmas okay I, I don't know why i had this idea just you know i got a wild hair across my ass i was like let's see if i can do it right and i wrote a story every week for five straight weeks and one of them was a story called telepaths don't need safe words telepaths it, don't need safe words telepaths don't need safe words so it was science it. fiction okay. science fiction kink erotica you know all the characters are bisexual and it's just you know um, and this is the day the internet was so primitive in those days that it's like the story is only about 4,000 words long and I had to cut it into four pieces to oh, post it. Oh, wow. So yeah. Like you couldn't yeah. post a whole thing that was 5,000 words because it was overflow people's buffers or whatever. Um, and it was like, I had to cut it up into pieces, you know, because that Episodic. was too long. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, so it's like, yeah, pretty funny. But, uh, you know, now you can post that entire thing in one Facebook post, yeah. but it, whatever. Um, yeah, pretty funny. So, and it was the first time I wrote and written a story. You know, here I'd done, I'd done writing workshops. I'd been in these advanced fiction workshops in, you know, in college and, you know, whatnot. And I'd done some, you know, some of the genre stuff. And it was just like, I never felt like I had found my voice, my thing, right? Until okay. I wrote the story. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I've been waiting to do all this time. In, and it's erotic science fiction with a lot of kink in it. Um, what you know? Where can I sell it? And I immediately went out to try to find where can I where can I send the story? I, and I knew in my heart, I'm like, this is a good story. This is a really great story. And you know, I I, I ended up posting it to Alt Sex Bondage before we knew anything about copyright, of course, you uh, know, yeah. you know, whatnot. And you can still find it out there. But um, the uh, and, and, and the, I mean, the response I got to it, too, was really strong. Where people were just like, this is the greatest kink story I've ever read. Wow. You know, how wow. experienced were you in kink? You know, I'm like, I am not experienced at all. I made this all up. Um, but, you know, whatever. Incredible. Um, yeah, amazing. And I just, uh, and it turned out, you know, you you can you could get books in those days called Writer's Market. And it was like this phone book of literally thousands of magazines and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. book publishers. I remember and that, actually. Whatever. Yeah. And um, every single place that would accept science fiction had a rule that said no erotica. And oh. every single place that would take erotica said no science fiction. And I'm like, why? <laughs> what? You know, I'm like, what happened to the previous generation that these two things had to be separated? You know, like, I, I don't understand why this would be. And, you know, and I go into science fiction conventions and talking to editors and whatever. I'm like, why is this? And they're like, I don't know. You know, I guess because we think in the science fiction industry that like science fiction is kind of for kids. It's kind of, like, uh, 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 you know, or yeah. like, yeah, you know, as Isaac Asimov isn't for kids, but you're ex expecting that some kids between age 10 and 14 are going to read it. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're going to read The Hobbit. They're going to read The Lord of the Rings. They're going to read Heinlein and whatever. And yeah. At the time, I didn't know how much, how much kink there was in Heinlein. But anyway, <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a the very first bisexual character in science fiction is, is Robert Heinlein's Lazarus Long, and he appears in yeah. 1941. So, yeah, it's like bisexuals have been in science fiction for a very long time, but they weren't allowed to actually have sex on page except like a brief period in the 70s when everything got over sexualized, I think. And then, you know, mm -hmm. very boom, chicka, wow, wow. And then it got mm -hmm. suppressed back down again in the 90s. Uh, uh, uh. Right. And so here I am in it's 1992 and I'm like, well, I think the chocolate and the peanut butter go together. I can't be the only one who thinks the chocolate and the peanut butter should go together, but hmm. apparently, apparently I'm going to have to start my own publishing house to do this. And so Got it. I started, I started circlet press and I, you know, I published telepaths, don't safe words and two other short 
kink stories that I wrote then as a you know, as a chapbook. Like, yeah, you know, I'm like, this is how poets do it. They just put like 40 poems together in a thing and they walk around and sell it at conventions. I can do that. I'm just going to do it with short stories, right? And um, I literally stapled 100 copies together with a big stapler on the floor of my apartment. I did the photocopying at my day job when people were not looking. Hey, that's um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was working in a book publishing house, you know, or whatever. And I was just like, I'm just going to take my pages down and copy one page a day for a, a month, you know, kind of a thing and mm. that kind mm. of thing. And so I, I stapled them together, brought a hundred copies to a convention. You know, I brought it to a science fiction convention in New York called Lunacon. And um, by Saturday afternoon, I was sold out. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, wow. okay, I am not the only one who likes to put the chocolate and the peanut butter together. <laughs> You know, and uh, it's like this is the, this is the whole thing about the internet, right? You're never the only one who has a n wildest kink you can possibly name. There's someone else out there, and they've probably started a group of people, you know, right? You're so, right. And, and you're this right. is what we were. This is the early days of the internet, though. So we were just learning that it's like, oh, you're not alone. There's other people like you, and you can find them if you, you know, yeah. So I started a publishing company, and then I immediately start getting stories in the mail from like professional science fiction writers like members of the science fiction writers of america oh, being, oh wow. i have i have stories like that at home in a drawer can i send them to you and i'm like sure so wow. the next books that we published from circlet were not i did not have to write i started doing anthologies and you know things like that um it's like let's do one about elves let's do one about yeah. cat fetishes let's do you know whatever anything we could name yeah, different subjects let's yeah. do one about you know ritual magic you know whatever yeah. and it's like oh that's kinky yeah <laughs> People, stories would come in we'd buy them we'd publish them um and then yeah I, I ran that company for 28 years or something i've lost count of how many it was and in 2020 i sold the company oh, um, oh. to another publishing company so oh. again so i could spend more time on my own writing ha <laughs> ha um <laughs> but uh yeah but, yeah, yeah. but for, for a couple of decades that that was one of my jobs yeah um and it's very very hard to make any money in publishing so yes i know, you know um, mm -hmm. book publishing is more like farming you know it's the yeah. whole, the joke about you know oh the farmer won the lottery what are you going to do with the money he's like oh just keep farming until the money runs out <laughs> right yeah. and it's like you it's know true. running a small press is a lot like that but uh, you know i believed in what we were doing i believed that we were giving voice to queer voices especially that were not getting published anywhere else because yeah. nobody nobody was in that genre then and then you know paranormal romance didn't exist yet you know, uh, yeah, there yeah. was sort of like there was Anne Rice and there was Circlet Press and that was it, you know. So, um, yeah. And uh, now, of course, in the self-publishing revolution, you know, anyone who wants to be like, well, I'm going to write about wear leopards with four penises. Yeah. Yes. Can just go do it, you know, and it's like yeah. more power to you, you know, but I'm like, there's a way in which I feel like these are these are my children, you know, like these yes. are my. I, know, yeah, like, I've, I've written too. Believe me, I relate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's been fun. And then, um, you know, and then of course I needed a place to sell the books. I started going to more kink conventions. I started teaching more classes. I started, you know, whatever. And then at the same time, the stuff is going on within LA, New England. You know, let's, let's come to, to that because that's yeah. an interesting piece, and uh, you brought it up a moment ago. Yeah, you were um, you were a charter member. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, one of the first twelve members to get the charter for for NLA New England. Yeah, you can. Yeah, tell us about that National Leather Association New England. Right. right. So you know the NLA had just mm -hmm. had their big conclave. I think it was in Texas. You know where they were like, okay, we're going to start. We're going to start a national level organization, and then you can start a chapter wherever. Mm -hmm. You know. So um, mm -hmm. a woman named Joan Donnelly, who was a member of the T Bears, which was a lesbian motorcycle club here fascinating um, yeah said all right i'm 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 gonna do it i'll put my name in you know i need this many members to sign up and then we can get a charter you know um and we met at a gay bar in cambridge called uh i think it's still there actually um called the paradise and the paradise um, okay yeah so and it was like which on a sunday afternoon at two o'clock there's nobody there right that's like they had a downstairs area that was deserted at that time of day and they were like yeah you guys can meet down there so which was good because we had no budget um, you know, we couldn't rent a space or whatever. It's like, you know, this this was at the level where it was like, okay, who who has access to a photocopier at their job so that we can get the newsletter copied, right? Because there was no money. And yeah. then I got a little tired, actually, of the chapter saying, well, the reason we can't be more politically active is because we don't need money. Is because you idea, don't need the money? 
no, they don't have any money, right? They oh, were just like, oh. you know, the chapter's not that big and none of us are rich and oh, got it. whatever. And I'm like, where do you think activists get their money from? But their idea of a fundraiser was they would go down to Club 119, which was one of the gay men's leather bars in in um in Boston on a Sunday night and do a 50-50 raffle where somebody would just walk around to everybody and be like, you want to buy 50-50 tickets? You want to buy 50-50 tickets? And at the end of the night, some winner would get $75 and the chapter would get $75, you know, like yeah. that level. And then the treasurer would go home and put that in a shoebox under her bed, you know? And yeah. I was like, this is not what I consider, you know, fundraising. Um, and I kept saying, you know what we should do? We should have a flea market. We should have, we've got all these people here, like this guy makes toys, this one makes floggers. We know these people who do corsets, you know, whatever. And this is at the time when like, if you wanted to buy a custom made corset, you had to like take your measurements and then send a self-addressed stamped envelope to a corset maker in Maryland, right? Oh, who would then send oh, you back oh. their catalog and then you would pick out a thing and call them on the phone and whatever. And then they would, you, you know, and then you would mail your measurements to them and then they would mail you a thing. And you know, it was just like, wow cumbersome you know, yeah. yeah 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 and it's like and you couldn't feel what the things felt like you couldn't you know yeah. come on would you buy a flogger sight unseen i mean i guess some people do but still it's yeah. like you you kind of want to see the stuff right and um so i thought let's just let's just do and you know if people want to sell their secondhand vhs tapes they can if people want to sell their you know whatever if a boot black wants to set up a table and shine people's boots for 10 bucks fine you know whatever you want to do yeah. So I and I kept saying to the chapter, we should do this. We should do this. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, but they, I could never motivate them to do it. And finally, I'm like, all right, look, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to run this event. I'm going to put it on my credit card. We're going to rent a hotel ballroom to do it in. And w because the a hotel ballroom, the straights will come, the gays will come, the, you know, whatever. Like people won't be like, oh, I can't go over there because. It's, oh, yeah. You know, it's a neutral location. Like, yeah. Right. Neutral location. Yeah. There won't be people who are like, uh, you know, like, oh, I won't go into a gay men's leather bar because right. whatever. Um, or being afraid that they won't be allowed in or, you know, any of yeah. those kind of issues. Exactly. Right? It's like, do it in Holiday Inn. And and then anyone who wants to do the thing of like, I'm just going to buzz past and take a look and I won't have to go in if I don't want to, can yeah. do that. Because anyone can walk into a Holiday Inn. So I you know, that first one, we didn't even get the whole ballroom. We just took two sections. I put it on my Visa card. I, we had 14 vendors and we charged two dollars at the door for people to come in and the one volunteer i had was someone who basically did a coat check where she just had a uh. a table and she took d donations and like clipped little cards onto them you know and whatever okay and i said what i need is the the two people the, the chair of the of the chapter you just need just i said you need to stand here with a garbage bag and just take money as people come in as they walk in they're going to throw two dollars in and then they can walk around and then they're going to leave that's it no program book, no programming, no demonstrations, no nothing. It was literally just, and it was like noon to five one day. And I think we made $600, huh? you know, for the chapter. And they were just like, you know, like it was so much money. And I was like, this is just the beginning, folks. This yeah. is, you know, and then yeah. everyone was like, oh, I can't wait till we do this again. And I mean, this was at the time when, you know, we didn't, the internet was not very big yet. So to advertise the thing, we literally like went to the pride parade and handed flyers to people oh, that said, okay, you know, whatever. And yeah. there were, there were a couple of fetish related shops or, you know, whatever. And we tacked up posters and, you know, put them up in the bars and, you know, whatnot like that. Like that's how you spread the word. But now everyone's like, oh, when are you going to do it again? You know, this was in the summer, right? It was right after the pride parade. And I'm like, well, let's do one in December and for Christmas shopping purposes. Right. Okay, so good. the next time we did, we took the whole ballroom. I had, you know, 29 vendors or whatever it was and you know by the next year we had made it five dollars at the door i had you know 50 vendors and it was like we had to move to a bigger hotel wow. because wow. we outgrew the, the, the holiday inn and it wow. just kept basically just kept getting bigger yeah the year it got the biggest was of course the year of the um of the paddleboro scandal um so you yes know. that's on that's yeah. for me to ask yeah, you yeah. too Yep, yep, yep. And remember, when NLA New England got started, part of what motivated Joan to do it was that there was a gay men's play house, basically, in, I think, in Dorchester or South Boston called Club Thunderhead. And it was just some Club guys Thunderhead? who- Thunderhead? Thunderhead, yeah. Okay. And they basically just had made, they made their basement into a dungeon. And um, people who have had were there would remember it because they're, they had sort of like these- what looked like spider webs made of chains sort of uh, in the 
like the alcoves, you know, and whatnot. And they charged people five bucks at the door to basically cover the spread of food that they would put out. Mm -hmm. And people and and as long as you knew what it was, you could go in and play. And the thing about their Sunday night thing was it wasn't just gay men. Um, a lot of the the leather lesbians and you know so forth oh, went okay. and um and it was open to everyone, right? Oh, okay, Pan, good. Pansexual. Remember back when pansexual referred to events and not people? <laughs> yeah. So yes. you know, yes. the pansexual event. Um and uh and the thing was they got raided and shut down. And, you know, some vice cops came, paid five dollars at the door, decided that that was prostitution and charged them with you know, running a body house and, you know, blah, 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 and essentially um, destroyed their lives, you know, um, and that that was the end of it. And it was like the, they, the, the, the shame, the, you know, the outing, the, you know, whatever. And it was like they were of the, of the older generation and they and no one spoke up for them. It was like yeah. somehow the community was not organized enough at that time <laughs> to have a political voice. And essentially one of the reasons Joan started NLA New England is she's like, never again, we need to get organized. We need to, you know, whatever. And, and then, you know, I was basically like, well, by getting organized, we need to get everyone in the coalition, you know? So the, the spanking clubs, the straight <clears throat> suburban couples, the people who do the, the pony people, the, yeah. you know, the goths, the, you know, everyone needs to be on board with this because we yes. all like speaking yes. and bondage and, you know, whatever. And we all don't want the government busting into our bedrooms um so so yeah when, was so this, when did this happen so thunderhead happened it must have been 1990 yeah or okay. maybe 1989 okay. yeah um and uh so it happened basically right when i moved to boston right and it was it was what all the talk was about but it was like so right around 1990 so it yeah so it's just community was not organized yet though yeah. so right so 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 now we've got our NLA chapter, which can act as sort of the umbrella point for everyone to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, you know, these other clubs, I'm like, you don't have to be political, but you have to be ready when something happens. You yeah. know, like when, when when we need to raise money the next time somebody yeah. is going to go to jail because they're kinky, this is what we're for, right? Yeah. We This is why we have the 501c3 or whatever and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This. Yeah. Well, then it happened. <clears throat> so. Fast forward to, you know, fast forward to the year 2000. Here we are coming into the new century, you know, and whatnot. And some, guess what? Some kinksters were in Attleboro, Massachusetts, having a play party at a space that was, um, you know, like an industrial space that had been converted. And a bunch of other stuff was in that building. Also, there was like a, a recording studio and some other stuff. But it was not what we would call prime real estate. Now it is, right. of course. But at the mm -hmm. time, it was like, you know, yeah. like a, almost a derelict building, right? And um uh, and, you know, police got wind of it, whatever. Um, they charged the host with, first of all, they, char they charged him with assaulting an officer when, of course, it was the officer who assaulted him, but never mind. Um, you know, yeah. this was before yeah. before it was it was cool, you know. Um, and they, they charged a woman at the party with uh, assault with a dangerous weapon for spanking another woman at the party with a wooden spoon. Um, and they didn't actually witness this happening, but one of the party guests, when they, they they did what they used to do when they would raid a gay bar, they took everyone's driver's licenses so you couldn't leave, and then they separated everyone and they interviewed them all separately yeah. about what was going on. And of course, yeah. most people were just like, "Nothing was going on here. This is just a but. This is a costume party. They did whatever." But there was one guy who I guess let it slip, right? And he was just like, "Oh yeah." This is what, you know, his yeah. mother told him never to lie to a policeman or something. And somehow he thought somehow he thought he was going to explain it in such a way that they would understand that it was all OK. They did not understand that it was all OK. Right. They right. they confiscated yeah. the toy bags, you know, so forth and so on. So this woman gets charged with assault. The woman who got spanked also gets charged with being an accessory to the assault on her own self. You know, yeah. and this is how ridiculous it was. Right. And the reason basically that no police department anywhere in the United States has raided a kink party in the last 24 years is because we made absolute laughing stocks of the Attleboro police. And today you can, people from Attleboro are still mad that they'll tell people, oh, I'm from Attleboro and people will go, oh, Paddleboro. <laughs> because, you know, we went, we went on a 
media campaign. You know, I went on a media campaign because I'm the one who is, I'm like, I'm the writer who uses her real name on her books and whatever. My yeah. face isn't, yeah. I, I'm not a children's librarian. I can be on TV. I can be on the radio. I can, yeah. you know. You can be the public I, face. Yeah. I can be the public face. This is my job, you know, so forth and so on. And um, yeah, that flea market, we had 4,000 attendees. Um, wow. And we weren't sure, were we going to get more people or were we going to get less because then people were like, oh, I don't want to show up because people yeah. might be there with cameras and whatever. And Fox yeah. News did show up with a camera, you know, whatever. But <clears> the <throat> venue wouldn't let them in. So they just filmed the line of oh. people in the parking lot waiting to get in because we couldn't get them in fast enough kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. And it was just, yeah. And it worked. It worked. We built our coalition based on the fact that everybody needs to do shopping. and. Yeah. You know, and That's then that was the, was the, you know, was the place where then all these groups ran their fundraisers, you know, and so forth and so on. And the Paddleboro Defense League, yeah, which is you know a coalition that was formed just for this, you know, uh, yeah, yeah ra raised tens of thousands of dollars for the legal defense um, of the of the guy run who ran the party. And um, in uh, the end, what happened to him? Yeah. In the um, end, well, in in the end. Um, the, the judge got tired of the, um, of the prosecution, not shitting, you know, he's like, shit or get off the pot after a year of them kind of pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. And every time they pushed it off, we had to pay the lawyers another couple thousand dollars, right? Because uh, uh, uh. they have to show up in court to be told, no, actually we're going to put it off for another month. And yeah. And then finally, it, and it was clear that the public pressure was getting to them, you know, uh, where it's like, you know, this, this, I don't know, assist assistant district attorney who thought he was going to have a big, you know, bump in per popularity over it, you know, instead, I think, yeah, it was like, nope, sorry, you're, you're not getting elected again. Because <laughs> people so was, were so mad. They were just was, like, was the person released or what happened? Yeah, so, well, so the thing was, yeah, he, in the end, he had to pay a misdemeanor fine for running a business without a license. Oh, and they okay. could not make, could not make any of the other charges stick, partly because they had violated all the rules of how you get evidence, you know, so forth and so on. I mean, they, they violated everyone's oh, rights. Oh, I see. Right? You're not actually allowed to take everyone's driver's licenses, separate them, and interrogate them. That's actually not legal unless you have, you know, probable cause, right? And oh, it's like there was I see. drug use going on. There was no, you know, whatever. So in the end, the, the judge basically, he was like, none of this evidence is admissible, you know, oh. and, um, and, and actually, I don't think it is illegal for consenting adults to play let's pretend with each other you know you know they, they it of course did not legalize anything this didn't legalize kink but it meant right. that basically no police department anywhere was ever going to do something like that again yeah um yeah and so far it's held up because you know and we just had you know an anniversary of paddleboro right and i i i posted about it on Twitter. And so many people were like, oh my God, I never heard of this. And I'm like, oh, let me tell you this story. And like, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It went viral, yeah. you know, and whatever. Cause it's, I mean, it's one of the great stories of our time. And yes. I went back and reread, you know, the, the mm. Boston Globe op-eds about it and the, you know, the, the Boston Herald even, which is the slightly more conservative paper, you know, whatever, but they were all over it. They were just like, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is the stonewall for kinky people. You know, this is the stonewall for people who like to spank each other for fun, you know, and, um, and it should, and, and people who like to spank each other for fun are perfectly okay. <laughs> you know, like that was as far as we could get them to go. Like we couldn't, get, you know, but it's like everybody yeah. got a big education and it was like, and in, for it to happen, especially in New England, which is not usually considered very avant-garde in, you know, like this is the place where band in Boston used to be a, yeah. a phrase, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, was was sort of just added juice to the whole, I don't know, to the whole thing. So it was like, all right, see, it worked. It worked. Um, but finally, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, was it 2023, you were finally keynote speaker at IMSL? Right. Yes. <laughs> I Tell was us supposed about to that. Actually, I was supposed to be keynote speaker in 2020, of course, and then yeah. 2020 did not happen. I think IMSL that year was supposed to be in April and like everything shut down in March right. and it was like, yeah, no. And yeah. For, at first they were like, well, maybe we'll have, be able to have the thing in a couple of months. And then of course we didn't. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of cool to get to do it in 2023. And then the, the, the ironic part was that the IMSL that I was supposed to speak at was going to be in California. They're going to be flying me across the country, you know, whatever, and blah, blah, blah. Instead, the, the 2023 one was in Piscataway, New Jersey. Oh. 
Oh, okay, yeah. Which Because is, it has moved. It's it's moving around, right? It, it, it moves around, you know, Yeah. and so forth. But um, so this is about a ten, about ten miles from where I went to high school. Let's put it that way. Wow, wow. Right, and it's like I I got out of New Jersey because you know at the time I. saw nothing but a sea of, of suburban conformity, you know, and so forth and so on. Um, and I'm like, uh, you know, a person like me didn't feel like I had a place there. Um, and then it's just, yeah, it was just really funny that I'm like, here I am, you know, giving this, this speech, you know, all these fantastic, wonderful, you know, gender bending kinksters are here, like practically in my hometown. I mean, you know, several towns over, but pretty close, <laughs> you know, those are just a couple exits away. And it was like, Okay, you know, talk about full circle. Well, I don't know, you know, a little bit, but yeah. So that that was that was super fun. What did you talk about? I I told I told the story actually of, you know, how we weren't ready for Thunderhead and we were ready for Paddleboro, and about how things how important things are. I said, you know, basically the importance of getting together and that Uh you know, Imsil, -huh. Imsil is precious and do not take it for granted because. You know, here we just spent three years in, you know, lockdown and whatever. And and there are a lot of forces that are trying to take away our ability to get together. That's correct. And they and they range from, you know, the rise of right wing, you know, et cetera. There's book Yeah. burning. There's there's libraries that won't rent to gay groups anymore because they're afraid of the conservative backlash. And then you've got sort of capitalist reasons on the other end where things like hotels that are like, well, we we aren't renting to uh, to any groups that aren't like corporate groups anymore, because what they what they really are is not a hotel who's in the business of providing hospitality. They are a real estate prospecting company. And the value of a building goes down if you use it too much. You know, they would rather a hotel stands empty and they're you know, with a skeleton crew of staff, then actually provide the services, you know, so forth and so on. Of course, if you're willing to throw enough money at them, maybe they'll deign to let you in, you know, so forth and so on. But it's like, mm, yeah, so, th and that's not obviously just in the kink world. That's in, Yeah. 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 Just in business. I mean, literary festivals are like, where can we go when, you know, this, that, the other, just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're like, oh, if you're, if you're Microsoft and you want to come and have like an executive retreat, Yeah, that that will do. Give us two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you know, blah blah blah, and we'll throw in free spa massages for everyone, you know. But it's like, oh, you've got, you know, you've got two thousand people who want to come to um to give you know book autographs and talk about books and whatever, and you know, blah blah blah, and you know, and run up and down the halls dressed like elves. Nah, you know, yeah, no, you can't, you can't give us enough money for that. <laughs> you know, and it's like okay. So yeah, there's a lot of things that are that are really in, and then of course, I mean things like literal biology, viruses, and whatnot are you know literally trying to keep us from getting together, and just Yeah. the importance of you know communities are real, and Yeah. even communities where you only see one another once a year, you know, are real important parts of our lives, and we can't forget that. So that's what that was about. But somewhere out there is a young kinkster someplace who's exploring some of these things. What advice can you offer that person? Hmm. What advice can I offer that person? I think, um, I mean, my advice is, is do it yourself. That if you don't see the thing that you want, build it, you Uh know, -huh. like it, it's like, I, I feel like there are a lot of people who are kind of waiting around for someone else to do it. And it's like, if I kept waiting around for someone else to do it, the flea market never would have happened. Yeah, Circle of press you're would right. not have happened. You know, You're just, right. and I'm like, I had to just be like, uh, you know what? I just have to do it myself. And it meant I had to go out and acquire the skills and make yeah. the, you know, make the contacts, find Yeah. the, you know, whatever, do the, And yeah, it's it's not easy because sometimes you're like, well, I don't even know how to, I don't even know where to start. But you know what? There's this thing called the internet now. You can Google. Yeah. Um, and there are other, and as soon as you, it's that old, you know, let's put on a show. As soon as somebody's like, I've got a barn, someone else will be like, well, I've got costumes and I've got, you know, whatever. People Yeah. love to help. People love to be parts of things. One of the things that made the flea such a, a big thing was because uh, we, 
get, we had the largest like volunteer crew of any, uh, you know, any event because we just, we give anyone a job and uh -huh. it's like, uh -huh. I'm like, well, we've got a hundred vendors that need to get in. How about we have give them load in help? Most yeah. places don't do that. Most vendors, you got to drag your own shit everywhere. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, let's have a load in crew who would, you know, whatever. And then we'll have a load out crew and then we'll have a, you know, whatever. And I'm, I just keep creating more jobs so people can feel like they're yes. part of it. And then the more people were part of it, the more people got interested then in also being in charge of it and being, you know, whatever. And the reason it grew at, of ultimately wasn't because I was like, I think we should do this. And we, it's because other people were like, I think we should have more programming. I think we should have nighttime programming. I think we should have a party. I think we should. I'm like, great. You're in charge of that. You're in charge yeah. of that. You're in charge of that. And then, and then I'm like, and I got to step back and be like, I'm not even the director of this thing anymore. I'm like, someone else can be the director. Someone else can be in charge of media. I'm just going to keep doing vendors and hotel because that's the hard part, you know, and whatever. So I did that for years and then eventually, you know, step back from that. So, um, but you know, yeah. When it's did not it... even if you, build, if you build it, they will come. It's like, you just have to, you have to even think of building it in the first place, <laughs> you know? So. But uh, Fetish Flea Market closed some time it, ago. It yes? did. Be between the, the pandemic, which of course put everyone you know in a hole but yeah. the uh the the hotel where they'd been having it for many many years um part of the reason that that hotel was so supportive is because the owner um was you know who owned like 20 different hotels in mm -hmm. you know rhode island in southern new england um the, what you know the the head of the sort of their board of directors was you know the owner yeah. um was somewhat aged eventually he died and oh. then when the board of directors, you know, kind of reevaluated their business when he, once he was gone, they were basically like, they got rid of all their non-corporate business. They were another oh, one of those I places see. that were just like, they, they put the hotel through like a $10 million renovation and then immediately kicked out all of the non-corporate business. So we weren't the only convention that was happening there. Yeah. There was also a uh, tethered together was also happening there. Um, a steampunk convention took place there. There was like a, a, a you know, twice yearly art fair, they got rid of all of them and it's uh, like you know and uh between that and then there was you know sturm and drong among the board members and there was there was a lot of fighting over me too there was a lot of fighting over a lot of the issues that you know have been hitting us since 2018 say right and yeah. then that on top of 2020 having you know no events for a couple of years you know uh N neela basically disbanded they yeah. Yeah. eventually the people who are in charge were just like we just can't do it anymore yeah. and it and and we can't pass it to a new generation you know who are not ready and the the, the new ways of doing things maybe are different from the way we used to do them anyway so it's time for young activists to form their own organizations yeah. do their own whatever and i think yeah. i think all the money went to the national coalition for sexual freedom they're like all right whatever what's left in the bank account it's going to go to them and then yeah and they disbanded um that but, had to um, yeah. You had to have some feelings over that. I, I did, um, especially because there was some, um, you know, there was that whole like, oh, well, if only I hadn't stepped away, maybe I could have helped fix it, you know, whatever. But, yeah, you know, there comes a time when you're just, you know, it's like, this is not my thing. It was never my thing. It always belonged to the community. Yeah. And if the community wants something else, then it's time to move on, you know, and yeah. Um, a couple of people have tried to start some sort of smaller things to, you know, and I said, start small and grow. You know, you, you don't have to start with a 2000 person convention right yeah. out the gate, you know, do, do a thing at a local VFW hall for 200 people. That's how we, yeah. you know, that first one, we had 300 people who paid $2 each. That was, you know, and that was the most kink people we'd ever seen in one place at one time in new England, right up to that point, you know, Maybe maybe there needs to be more online stuff. Maybe there needs to be more. I don't know. You know, there, there's there's new ways of doing things, um, and it can't always be about money. It can't always be about, you know, um, yeah. So just that young activist who, you know, if there's something that you want, you know, try to figure out what it is, and then go out and make it happen. Because once yeah. you start, once you start carrying that banner, people will follow you. You know. Yeah, pe uh, people yeah, will be like, right. yes, I want to help. I, I want to do a thing. And yeah, it means getting along with people, which is what a lot of people are not good at, you know, but, you know, that's, that's, one of, that's well. part of the learning curve, right? They said, we, we as activists, we always start out as mavericks. 
right? But the maverick always ends up the the leader of a of a pack of a of a herd, right? The maverick goes off, and then the whole herd follows, right? And it's like, well, I wanted to be my myself, but I guess I'm leading all you guys now, right? So it's just, yeah, you be be a maverick, but then be prepared to, uh, to transition into being an administrator. <laughs> you know? How many years total did did it run? Let's see. The first flea was in ninety four. Okay. And then I guess it ran until 2020 might have been the last one then. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it was okay. right before the, we had it in February, 2020 and everyone kind of knew COVID was coming sometime, yes. but we weren't sure how quickly. Yeah. And yeah. And then, yeah, that, mm. so that, that was really the last one. Um, Actually, did they, I'm trying to think if there was like one after that where they maybe like a, I can't believe I can't remember this because this is not that long ago. We're only in 2024 when we're doing this. So sometime in the last four years, I feel like they tried to get one more to happen. And it just didn't go. Yeah. yeah I think, I think yeah. it didn't. There have been some, there have been some mini ones where some people did like a, a VFW hall and, you know, oh, I see. it was great, yeah. but um, you know, yeah, but there, there hasn't been one big tent one where we got lots of groups uh -huh. together or lots of, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and, uh, occasionally people see me and they say, cause you know, I didn't just run fleas here in new England for a while. One of the things I did with, um, with the help of leather by Danny, um, was we ran fleas, you know, smaller size fleas in Atlanta and Houston and oh, wow. North Carolina. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And wow. we, we kind of had the idea that if we could get them to grow, we could actually <laughs> make a little bit of a living doing mm. it right as as yeah. convention organizers but it's hard to do because the, the hotel basically can bankrupt you at any time they can literally just take ten thousand dollars out of your credit card when you're not looking and be like oh we've decided that you owe us this money uh, I, i'm not, uh, I'm not uh, kidding i'm not kidding got it um yeah. we, we had a hotel in atlanta essentially do that to us and then be like well but will you come back next year so you can make it back and we were like i guess i don't know it was it was strange yeah um, Atlanta, we did some really good ones in Atlanta, but yeah, you know, we never really made much money. It, like, and it, at a one where we made a, a big profit, I took home maybe two thousand dollars, and Danny took home two thousand uh, dollars. Uh, you know, uh, which yeah. for six months of work, really, to yeah. make an event happen. But the the point was to put them in some areas where they didn't have a big tent yeah. event going on, get mm -hmm. the community together, and then the idea was always to then step away from it once it uh, got uh, going. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, so. Yeah. That's part of why we were doing them there and not places like, I don't know, Philadelphia or mm -hmm. um, places where, yeah, I'm sure we would have made more money if we did them in places where there was a big active leather community, you know, so forth and so on. Like we wanted to go to places where they needed somebody to come in and bring people together. So, yeah. you know, that's why we did them in those places. And, you know, some somebody will rise up to to do that again. You know, it's too good an idea to not, you know, and people still love to shop. <laughs> you yes. Know, people people still need to try the corsets on and feel the floggers and you know they always will they always will exactly so you know um yeah. yeah 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 what's the biggest misconception about you the biggest misconception I th people always expect me to be some kind of hard ass i think they think first of all they think i'm tall which i'm not um because i have a big personality i guess and then they they somehow expect me to be really militant i think Hmm. Like they just, I don't know. And I'm like, the only things that I'm really, really rigid about are that everyone has to be included. <laughs> you know, like, like yeah. the only thing I'm intolerant about is that you have to be tolerant. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just like, you know, so I think, I think people somehow expect that I'm going to be this like imperious domineering figure. Wow. You no, know, but that's the whole you know, like that's one of the fallacies, right? It's not, doms are not always in charge of everything, you know? In fact, I sure. kind of feel like some of the most functional leather groups in particular, ones where there's not too many doms trying to vie for who's in charge. It's like, yeah, you gotta have a lot of switches and subs. That, that's <laughs> yes. the secret. <laughs> you know? yeah. Switches and subs in charge of stuff get more done, you know? <laughs> um, there's yeah. the truth yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think people always expect me to be sort of, yeah, somehow like, uh, uh, like I'm going to be literally cracking a whip. And instead, I'm like, oh, do you want to do a thing? I would love for you to do a thing. How can I empower you to do a thing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like, oh, uh, 
you want to do a thing that I don't want to do even better, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like the, the art of delegation. I went to the, I think it was the second uh, leather leadership conference back when they were being held at the, at the center in New York city. Mm -hmm. um, and it was eye opening that l almost every one of the sessions that I went to was somebody being like, and number one rule is de delegate, make sure you delegate, be setting up who's going to take your job when you retire, you know, so forth and so on, delegate, delegate, delegate. And I'm like, huh, okay. And I came back from that and I said to our local, you know, committees and whatever, I'm like, I think we should, first of all, I think we should put in a bid to run Leather Leadership Conference here because everyone here needs to hear the same message, <laughs> you know? Yeah, oh, don't try you, to do everything yourself because I I tried to do everything myself for years and burn you know I burned myself burned out up. pretty bad. But, but you brought up an interesting know. piece there yeah. um, about you know what happens when you retire. I'd like to know mm. how you would like to be remembered hmm. by the community. How would I like to be remembered by the community? I would like to be remembered as a pioneer, um, I guess you know, and that I think. You know, the uh, I want to be remembered as sort of like that, yeah, that person who put a pin in the Venn diagram where sort of kink and science fiction cross over. And Love it turns it. out that it's, you know, somebody was like, oh, it's not even a Venn diagram with like a little cross. Really, these two circles just overlap <laughs> you know? and I, with a little bit of fringe on either side. I'm like, you might be right. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm like, maybe that's more obvious now than it was in 1991, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, and that I think. I'd almost like to be remembered as someone who um, could take the, you know, those lessons about consent and negotiation and apply them to other areas of life, because I feel like that's what everyone, that's the lesson everybody should be learning from the leather community is that, Agreed. you know, um, and even, you know, vanilla poly relationships are learning it. You know, in fact, I've got a non kinky poly friend and he's like, oh, yeah, and we call our parties play parties, too, because it's clearly all on the same model. We just don't have as much equipment, you know, <laughs> I'm like, right, you know, OK. And just, you know, it's like uh, there's there's a lot that people can learn, I feel like, from our from our subculture. And I just, you know, I, I I've I even my books that are not overtly kinky, I've tried to, like, communicate those community values <laughs> in them, uh. you know, so it's like. You know, perverts save the world in a lot of my books, you know. <laughs> so, I love it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pervert save the world. Pervert save the world. That is not the know? title of the biggest thing. <laughs> I don't know what is. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pervert save Cecilia, the world. Cecilia Tan, I am so grateful. And I sincerely thank you for this. It's been an incredibly entertaining chat. And I'm <laughs> and I thank you very much. You're very welcome. For in, very welcome. To participating in Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed being had. So, you know. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out the Fireside Chat channel for more chapters in the history of leather. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe.